Hello. Howdy. That's my Arc City uh, intro. Howdy. Every time. Um, I'm going to be teaching through Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 18. Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 18. So I moved here about just a little intro on, onto myself. I moved here actually a couple years ago from uh, Arizona. I uh, had no intention of moving to Kansas. Um, to be honest, I never wanted to move anywhere inward away from the coast. Uh, I felt like the desert was far enough from the coast for me. Um, but the cool thing that, that God has shown me is that there are really believers everywhere you go. I, I was under the assumption that people in the middle were, were lost. Um, not a good assumption to make, but... Um, and I had a lot of preconceived notions in regards to um, uh, different uh, kinds of churches, like Pentecostal churches and Baptist churches. I had no um, experience with meeting anyone from any other uh, type of fellowship. I was Calvary through and through. My dad was a Calvary pastor. I grew up, uh, that was the only kind of Christian I knew. And so I was terrified of meeting people from other denominations. And I ended up in a small town where there was a bunch of, there's a, now to this day, a bunch of amazing believers who love Jesus from different denominations. And I've been super blessed um, and been able to be a part of the ministry out there and serving and finding all of these young people to uh, bring to Jesus and bring Jesus to them. Um, with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and open up and pray, and then we'll get started. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. Thank you that um, your word is, is a lamp into our feet and a light into our path, Lord, that you teach us, you speak to us. Um, Lord, we ask that you would just lead us by your spirit and uh, speak to us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So the book of Colossians was, or the epistle uh, to the Colossians was written by Paul while he was in prison. There's a, a man by the name of Epaphras who went out uh, to speak to Paul, uh, to minister to Paul, to be there with him in prison. Uh, but there was an issue going on in the, Coloss Col uh, the church in Colossae. There was uh, false teachers amongst the crowd um, who were both uh, pushing towards legalism as well as uh, going against the, uh, the teaching that Jesus was God. They were... Um, they, they believed that God couldn't be known. And if Jesus was able to be known, he couldn't therefore be God. And, that, uh, and, and Paul uh, has a really interesting way of addressing the situation. Um, he starts off with an uh, acknowledgement of who they are, saying, you guys are awesome, you are, are full of faith, hope, and love. Um, I've heard stories that you guys love Jesus and you guys are on fire. And then he uh, shares a prayer with them, what, is, what his desire, what his heart is behind this letter of the epistle uh, uh, of Colossians to them, um, that he wants them to, to come to maturity, basically. But then he uh, starts off here, and this is where we're going to be, and, and, and really talks about Jesus' deity and, and that um, he is God and that... Um, He's absolutely necessary. Everything was made for him and through him. Um, he is uh, the preeminent one. He's the one um, who's the most important. He was man, um, but he was ultimately God. And, and Paul is, is fighting back against this false teaching by these guys. Uh, verse 9, I'll go ahead and, and get started. It says, For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. And to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So, uh, once again, Epaphras came to him and let him know what was going on. Epaphras was, uh, we believe, to be uh, a leader in the church of Colossae. He was a pastor, uh, one of the, the starters of the, of the church there. And he relayed to Paul all, uh, all of the information about the, the church in Colossae, saying, Hey, these guys are awesome. However, comma, there are these false teachers, and uh, we need some help. And so 
immediately says for this reason uh, once he heard about these things once uh, him and the people he was with found out about this they started praying and they wouldn't stop praying Um, but I want to take a look into what they were praying for Um, because uh, the way that we pray or at least I'll say the way that I pray and the way that Paul prays are almost two different things um, I tend to pray for my friends and, their, and, and the people around me, the community around me. I pray a lot for their physical needs. I pray a lot um, uh, for um, just things that eternally have no value. And here we see Paul start off with saying, uh, asking that they may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. The first point of his prayer happened to be uh, a desire for them to know God's will. Um, not just God's will for their life, obviously that's part of God's will, but God's will in the grand scheme of things, his divine will, his divine purposes, what he wanted to accomplish. And he, uh, he, the way that he phrased it was that they may be filled with the knowledge. Uh, so what we can get from that is that it's not a, a learned knowledge for them. It's more of like a relative, uh, a revela- revelatory um, knowledge that is given by God. And he uh, wants them to have the knowledge of his will um, with all wisdom. Wisdom, uh, I, I like to define it as actionable knowledge. Knowledge that is able to be put into action. Not just knowledge that's in your head, but what you can, you know, uh, do stuff with. Like, um, and then it says with spiritual understanding. This is the idea of having the spirit of the Lord giving you the understanding of of what to do, how to do it, and everything in regards to that. Um, I like that they're together because we can have Um, actionable knowledge we can have wisdom apart from spiritual understanding and what that leads to is just religion it's because I'm doing the right thing I know this is what I'm supposed to do so I'm going to do it I know I'm supposed to go to church so I'm going to be there you know I know I'm supposed to be nice to this poor guy um, so I'm going to do that but apart from um, the spirits leading it has no value Uh, in verse 10 it says that you may walk worthy of the Lord fully pleasing to him. Um, Paul's just desire, his heart behind this, his heart behind the letter uh, uh, was to see them grow into full maturity in the Lord, um, that they wouldn't be um, turned to the left or to the right, and he wanted them, their walk with the Lord, to be pleasing to him, uh, to have their walk be for the pleasure of the Lord rather than to do the right thing because it's the right thing. Um, He wanted them to walk worthy, fully pleasing to the Lord, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Um, Being fruitful in every good work. uh, There's a, the way that I like to, I I see, I like to see that rather, um, or picture it rather, um, is you can have, you can do a lot of good works that bring no fruit. You knew a lot of, of really, really good actions that have no meaningful value eternally. Um, and, and as you know, as believers, the only thing worth doing is, uh, are things that, will, that have eternal value. The things of this world, you know, the money that you make, the success you get, all of it is temporary. And, um, you know, sometimes the church just gets... Just gets so accustomed to just doing the good thing, doing the good work, you know, um, for example, like feeding the homeless, going out into the streets and, you know, meeting physical needs, which all are great things. Um, one thing I like to point out is, uh, you know, the mobsters used to do that too. Um, they used to provide turkeys for Thanksgiving for the low-income people. Uh, the, the cartel does it all the time. Like doing good things means squat diddly. Um, but uh, it has no meaning if it's not being led by the Lord or led by the Spirit. And so Paul wants them to have meaningful good works. 
He wants them to have works that will bring them eternal value. He wants them to, to have, like, what did Jesus say? Don't lay up for your, yourselves treasures here on earth, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. He wanted them to, to have those heavenly treasures that, that aren't temporary. And then it says, um, being fruit, or increasing in the knowledge of God. Um, he wants their, their um, not just their knowledge of God, of, of who he is, obviously, um, that's part of it, but like knowing God on a personal level, he wants that relationship to be continually building, uh, continually growing. Uh, there's that old saying, um, if anyone grew up, you know, in sports or you were in the military, uh, complacency kills, um, doing uh, nothing, you know, or not building, not growing, um, it kills you, you die, um, things are changing, relationships need to be um, built on and in, uh, um, worked on, and effort has to be put into it, but he uh, wants them to grow in their knowledge, not just relationally of God, but of their actual knowledge of who God is. They want, they want them to know um, God more on a, on a, uh, on an intellectual level, know who they're dealing with, know um, the God of the Bible, what he really is like, rather than um, the God who I believe God is, um, which can also, can always be absolutely different than what the Bible teaches. And so he wants their knowledge to, of God to be growing. And then it says, strengthened with all might according to the, his glorious power. I love, uh, he, he uses a lot of these phrases in a lot of uh, openings or intros into, uh, in, in his other letters, so I don't want to get too stuck into these, but I always love when he says, strengthened with all might according to his glorious, glorious power, because uh, one of my mom's favorite verses growing up, and she would always say it, and don't tell anyone else, but it's one of her passwords um, for a lot of things, uh, it's Zech- <laughs> Zechariah 4.6. It says, um, uh, the Lord talking to Zerubbabel saying, not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. And it's the idea of, it's not by collective uh, intellect. It's not by, you know, a committee coming together and deciding how to build this stuff. It's not by your own strength and your own power, your own intellect to build the things. It has to be the spirit of the Lord that does the work. And so Paul is saying, hey, I want you to, to be strengthened with all of the might according to his power, not your own. I don't want you to work it up. I don't want you to work it out. I want it to come from the Lord. And then it says, uh, for all patience and long suffering with joy. Um, the, the life of the believer, uh, this is one of the things I love telling new believers. Um, it's not easy. It's hard. It sucks because um, it doesn't suck. Sorry. Doesn't suck. I'm sorry. I've. Um, it does. It, it can be very hard. I'll say that. It can be very hard and discouraging. Um, walking with the Lord in the midst of a, a generation like we live in now is very hard. When all of the young men that I know are, are all the young men that I grew up with, rather, are either now making a bunch of money, uh, you know. Uh, going to the club and partying, right? Going and doing all of the things that the world says is fun to do or, or uh, what the world says is good for you to do. The life of the believer is different. It's, it's set apart. It's supposed to be holy unto the Lord, meaning we're not supposed to do the same things that the world does. We're not supposed to live our lives the same way that the world does. And, and because of that, it can be a, a, a lonely walk sometimes, a lot of the times. Um, it can be a lonely endeavor um, obviously, we have the Lord, but you know, on the earthly, earthly sense, it can be very lonely. Um, but He wants them to have the patience and the long suffering to be able to endure that, endure the hardships of the that the world has to offer uh, to those who don't like to live according to the world, um, and to to go through this and endure it with joy. Uh, that is the difference between a believer and an unbeliever, because. Uh, life sucks whether you're a believer or not, but if, if uh, the believer can really 
go through the suffering and the hard times and the trials and the temptations with joy and actually have joy in the midst of the chaos. And it's a, a beautiful thing, and this is something that Paul wants to see come to fruition in their lives. Um, and just to circle back around all of these ideas, it really gives an insight into the heart of Paul. Like, he didn't just want to, you know, he could have simply just wrote a letter to them saying, hey, this false teacher is, is dumb, he sucks, don't listen to him. I'm Paul, I'm an apostle, listen to me. Instead, his heart behind it was to see, not just get them to stop listening to someone else, but to grow, to, to mature, to, to um, yeah, grow in their walk with the Lord. So it goes here from this, uh, after verse 11, it goes from being a prayer into uh, uh, Paul giving thanks to the Lord, thanks to the Father. And it says, And giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. I like uh, the phrase or the, the word in between who and qualified that says has. It means that God has already done this, that the believer, all of the people entailed in this phrase have already become in future inheritors of, of the saints of the light. That the inheritance in heaven is already the believers. It's not something that has to be earned or worked up. It's something that they have simply because they believed in God and God said, here, now you're a son and daughter. Now you're part of the family. Now you get some of the riches. And so the, the first, the first nine, verses 9 through 11, it's like Paul, these are the things that Paul wants for the believers. And then he goes into thanksgiving to the Lord. This is what you already have kind of thing. Um, and then it says in verse 13, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of his son in love. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of, his, of the son of his love. I love this. Um, it reminds me, a lot of, of Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 4. It says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to, the power, uh, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling des the desires of our flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with, with, he, with which he loved us. So the idea here is that each one of us, uh, uh, specifically uh, the believers in, in the church of Colossae, he's saying, God took you out of being a slave in the kingdom of darkness. You are no longer a citizen of the world, of 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 sin and darkness, now you're a citizen of heaven. Now you're part of Jesus' kingdom. Now you are a new citizen. You are no longer the same. You have uh, a Jesus passport rather than, you know, an earthly passport. And I like uh, the word conveyed, which means like trans translated, transferred. It's It's literally like... I don't know, like, like you translate languages, just flip it on its axis, give it new, new ways of writing it. But uh, it said, you're a new person um, in this new kingdom of the son of his love, which we know is Jesus. Verse 14, these are the things that God has done in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. So, in Christ, in the Son of His love, we have been redeemed, um, pardoned, or forgiven. Uh, our sins were paid with a price. It wasn't a free gift, right? I, I often hear that, you know, salvation is free. 
It is, kind of, but it really was paid with the blood of our Savior. It was an overwhelming debt that none of us could have paid. It was a debt that, I don't know about if you guys ever, maybe you guys have debt, I have a little bit of debt. Um, and, you know, by the grace of God, I can pay, pay it off. But there's a debt I was born with that I, there was nothing I could do to earn, earn or, or pay for it. Or There's nobody's life I could take in order to give myself entrance into the kingdom or to pay that debt. But Jesus gladly gave his life for us. And then verse 15, it goes from being what God has done to who Jesus is. It says, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. What is the image of the invisible God? Uh, The very representation of God on earth, right? Excuse me. Jesus was a man who lived on the earth and he was God in the flesh and was man completely. Um, it reminds me of, of John 14, verses 7 through 9. It says, if you had known me, you would have known my father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. And Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, have I not been with you so long? And yet you have not known me. He who has seen me has seen the father. So how can you not say, how can you say, Show us the Father. Jesus, as we know, is God. He's part of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He's always been. Um, And and Paul's really coming against the idea that Jesus wasn't really God um, to uh, to the false teachers there. Um, But he is the image of the invisible God because no one can see God and live, right? Right? No one uh, can see God the Father and live. And then it says, the firstborn over all creation. Now, what this doesn't mean is that he was the very first person born. Um, But it does mean, uh, very similar to the idea of the firstborn blessing, uh, like Jacob, who was not the firstborn, got the blessing of the firstborn. Um, it, It comes along with the same idea here that, He is the most important, the preeminent, the one uh, who is over all of creation. And then verse 16, it says this, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. Um. Do you guys remember John 1? Good old John 1. Verses 1 through 5, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing that was made was made. In him was life, and the life was the light, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. He was involved in in creation. So what does this tell us? that he is creator. He was there at the beginning, and everything that was made, whether it was here on earth or in heaven, in this, on, you know, it was made through him, or created uh, through him. And it says both visible and invisible. There's a lot of things that we can't see. There's a lot of things that we can't see, and he's involved in every part of it. And then it says, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. So this is all authority. You know, every kingdom that's ever been from um, Rome to, you know, the king in England right now. Um, he is above it all. He has created all of these systems. Um, or, yeah, whatever. And then it says, all things were created through him. And for him. Everything was made. uh, 
in the grand scheme of things to bring him glory. All of these things were created through him and for him. And for verse 17, it says, and he is before all things and in him all things consist. He is in front of all things. He is the most important over all things that were created. And everything, uh, the idea of the word consist is, is held together. Like all of, you know, the world that we live in right now, the reality we're experiencing is held together by Christ. Verse 18, and he is the head of the body, the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. So we know the church is known as the body of Christ. He is the head. Uh, the, the, the picture there is that he's the leader. The church is the body. So the leader has the eyes, the brain. Um, he, he tells us where to go, what to look like, um, you know, what clothes we wear. He tells us all of these things. Um, and then it says, who is the beginning? Who is the beginning? Uh, he was there at the beginning with, with God during cre- in creation. He, uh, I, I love in the book of Revelations, uh, when he f- introduces himself, he introduces himself as the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. I always thought that was the hardest line in the Bible. That is so cool. Um, but he was there from the beginning and the end of time. The firstborn from the dead. The idea here is he's the most important human being ever that was ever alive. And that in all things he may have the preeminence. The preeminence. The preeminence means um, superiority or the most important. And here... Um, this is this is kind of the word that I wanted to stop on and, and sit on for a bit. I got eight more minutes. Um, but specifically in the life of the believer, um, Jesus has to be at the very forefront um, in our lives. Um, we have to be seeking him on a regular basis like our relationship with him is the most important thing more than anything else in our lives right we have a lot of relationships in our lives a lot of uh, things that take our time but the most important time that we can spend is the time that we spend with the lord and having him preeminent in our lives means that while i'm at my job right and i'm sweeping uh the front of the store i work at a barbecue restaurant by the way um, and while I'm sweeping in the front of the store, am I going to move the mat or just sweep around the mat? If Jesus is at the forefront of my mind, best believe I'm moving that mat out of the way, throwing it out of the way, and I'm sweeping every inch. It means every, every aspect of my life, every part of my life, I'm doing for the glory of him. Uh, there's, there's no, you know, cutting corners. Um, this is, this is, a really convicting one for me, but I don't speed, actually. Never mind, it's not. But I'm, that just means I'm not going to be speeding because Jesus is in the passenger seat with me, right? I have him on my mind. When I'm taking college cor- courses, I'm not going to be cheating like all of the rest of the kids in the class. When I'm at my, you know, whatever job it is, I'm not going to do all of the same things that my coworkers do when they're trying to make it easier on them. It's doing the work for the glory of the Lord. And uh, um, the goal for me in this uh, lesson, I didn't really have a whole lot of time to prep, I'll be honest. Uh, Patrick told me, yes, reached out to me yesterday, and I said, sure, I guess. And, <laughs> and now we're here. Um, but... Uh, The reason why I believe Colossians, this particular portion of Colossians stood out to me um, was me and a few buddies were talking about religion and relationship and and the differences between the two. And um, it really is, uh, what what came to my mind is is, is when, when I'm falling into a religious space or religious, 
I, I hate to say the Christian word season, but religious time period. Um, it's because I, I'm not having Jesus being a focus of my life. He's not being, he, I'm not giving him the preeminent space in my life. I'm going through the motions everywhere that I am. Um, and I really can tell when the telltale sign when, that I'm not walking daily with the Lord is my room starts to become a mess. Um, my house becomes a mess, rather. Um, but my, my goal and my desire for, for each one of you guys um, is, is that we would all return to the Lord. Um, we would all return to just the simple walking with Jesus and then the recogniz- recog- recognition that Jesus is God. He is Lord. He has authority. And just because time's hard sometimes doesn't mean that he's not in control and he's not working things out. Um, yeah, one of the things uh, that I, I remembered was uh, in Jeremiah 6, God says a very interesting thing to, thing to the uh, Isra- Israelites. He says, I really don't care about your sacrifices anymore. They mean absolutely nothing to me. But what I want from you is, is to return to me. And that's the heart behind tonight for me. Um, is because I've had a little bit of a rough season, I'll be honest. Um, but that we would just return to the Lord. Simple as that. Um, and, and not just try to appease him with, I'm going to church, listening to a worship song, I listen to a sermon, blah, 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 right? But rather, really with our complete hearts, minds, and souls returning to the Lord and having Jesus in the rightful place in our lives as the preeminent one, the superior one, the only one who is worthy to have a place in our lives above our own selves. Uh, With that being said, three more minutes, got it on time. Um, I'll go ahead and pray and then we're going to do another song. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for sending your Son, Lord. We thank you uh, that Jesus is is who he is in our lives, Lord, our our Savior, our Creator, our Redeemer. And Lord, I I just ask that you would uh, soften our hearts and return our hearts to you, Lord. Would you um, give us the strength to turn away from the things that have pulled us away from you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.